is Ann Hodder from Everybody Deserves Sex Education. She is the one that has helped us write these amazing educational guides for uh, East Coast News that you guys have all been enjoying that are downloadable now uh, on the ecn.com footer banner. Just click on that and all of the, the guides will come up. You guys can print them out and share them with your staff. Um, and Anne's going to go over some really important information with you today. So Anne, the floor is all yours. Thanks, Linda. Well, thanks everyone for having me. I'm going to share my screen right away because uh, I've got some good content for you and I want to make sure we don't go too over time. So here it is. One moment. It's going to take a sec. There we go. Okay. So today we are going to be talking about why sex ed sells. We hear about why sex education is so important. We've been hearing about it a lot more over the last few years. And I want to actually offer some tangible reasons why we know offering sexuality education in a retail environment can actually not just move product, but also uh, be incredibly valuable for a retail store's brand, for its staff, and for the impact that I know a lot of y'all really wanna have on your communities. So first off, this is me when I don't have my Mickey, is it Mickey or Minnie? Oh, it should be Minnie anyway. But I don't have my Mickey helmet, hood on. Um, I am a white queer femme and I use she and I also use their they pronouns. I have been certified to teach sex and relationships education from a few different organizations, including Planned Parenthood of Los Angeles. And I've been doing that since uh, professionally since about 2015. Uh, I am the founder and lead educator of Everyone Deserves Sex Ed, also known as EDC or EDSE. And we offer a bunch of uh, professional development trainings and sex education in schools and in institutions around mostly California right now, um, but also internationally via Zoom. And I also am the CEO of Hotter Media. Hotter Media, uh, some folks might remember. Um, Hotter Media is the first sex positive PR and marketing agency that was dedicated to adult product and sexuality type businesses. Founded in 2009, and Etsy is an offshoot of Hotter Media. And sometimes, depending on the client, some of the PR and marketing that we do incorporates educational content uh, included. So it's sort of like Etsy and Hotter Media have kind of overlapped for a lot of the work that we do. And I have worked in the adult industry specifically since 2007, which feels like a million years. Quick about uh, Etsy, founded in 2015, we offer sex, love, and relationships education from an empowered, affirming point of view. We also offer expansive professional development. So that's also for not just any adult industry professional, but we work with a lot of clinicians. We work with educators, we work with nurses and medical healthcare providers, really runs the gamut. And one of the things that we're most known for is our 35 hour sex educator certification, which we offer online three times a year. Enrollment for 2022 will open in a couple of weeks. We also offer private sex ed classes and uh, everything is now virtual 100% via Zoom. And at first that was a huge bummer. What that's actually allowed us to do now is work with people and companies literally around the world, almost every continent, I think probably except Antarctica, Antarctica at this point. Um, we'll see if anybody up there needs some of these services, but uh, the, the small silver lining of working on Zoom is now it's really accessible to people, no matter where you are, as long as you've got some kind of an internet connection. And uh, Etsy and ECN, we recently partnered, I mean, technically I think we partnered like a year ago, uh, but we've been working on this for such a long time to really perfect what we're offering. And among the initial offerings of the education guide. So I believe right now sexual orientation and flagging are available. We also talk about gender and identity. And we have uh, at least three product guides that are dedicated not just to how to sell a product, but also offering a little bit of history behind some of these products, where they came from, what are their origins, and how can we incorporate a little bit of extra information in addition to some of the sales features that a lot of folks uh, know to mention on the sales floor. We also do live workshops like this, we have some more planned for the future, and they won't all be hosted by me. We have a big team of sex educators who specifically have industry experience. So we'll be working with people who not only are trained to talk about sex and education and identity, but also have worked in this industry. So they know how to apply this information to uh, anyone along the supply chain. We have more planned for ECN customers and ECN events in the future. So let's dive in. What are we gonna to do today? We're gonna to review some group agreements. Uh, we're on a webinar, so these aren't as important, but I just kind of do them as a formality for every workshop. We're gonna learn a teeny tiny bit of each other if you want to participate in the chat. 
Then we'll discuss four key reasons why sex education sells. We'll talk about some resources that you all have access to. And then we'll have an open Q&A. So these group agreements. So uh, whether you're participating with the questions or you're going to be in the chat, we do have an open policy of respect, not just to me, but also everyone involved here. I don't uh, doubt that that's an, an issue here. I think everyone really enjoys working together, uh, which is one of the reasons why I love this industry. We're also going to assume the best intentions. So sometimes someone will ask a question and they might not have as much experience in a topic as other people in the room, the virtual room, uh, or they might use language that's a little bit antiquated, maybe isn't as uh, recent or as modern as some of us are used to. But we're going to assume that regardless of what someone is sharing or asking, that they have the best intentions and they're also here to learn. So we want to make space for that. Also, all of you all get to participate on your terms, including you get to just do nothing and just listen, uh, drink some coffee, look out the window. You can do whatever works for you, but please stay muted. I think that that's required on a webinar anyway. And uh, the chat is a great place to offer comments or questions. I can leave the chat open so that I can uh, check it out occasionally. And I also know that uh, Pete and Linda and Grace and the team have the chat open for themselves too. So got the boring stuff out of the way. I'd love to hear if you want to share what folks' roles are here. So I have on the screen right now, we've got store owner, store manager, sales rep, buyer, distributor, or something else. So if you want to share what your role is in the industry, please put it in the chat. And if it is something else, please tell us what you do. I love to see who's in our audience. And I'm going to open the chat right now. And I'll make a little bit of space for that. In, uh, in the industry, I've worked, I haven't had a couple different roles before Hotter Media was born. I actually got my start at XBiz as a copy editor and then a reporter, and then uh, helped found the actual sexo department that all of y'all are now uh, probably participating in. So that helped me get to know all the different brands and all the different people in the industry at the time. And it really let me dive into the deep end and uh, sort of accidentally helped Potter Media become what it was. So I will leave the chat open if you want to share what your roles are, but I'm going to move on because of time constraints. If I could talk to you forever all day today, I probably would. This is one of my favorite things to do. So why sex ed sells? We have four points that I want to make. First one, sex ed in the United States sucks. A lot of the stuff that we're going to be talking about today is U.S. centric when it comes to uh, education and some of the research that I'll be sharing. But absolutely, this can apply uh, internationally because we know that sex education, depending on the country and the city that you are in, can be really hit or miss. So I have some information specifically about the United States as of January of 2021. Some of you all might know this, some of you might not, but I think it's really important to all be on the same page about this. There is currently no federal law related to sex ed in school systems. So that means there is no general law for all the states to follow when it comes to offering information about sexual health and identity and pleasure and all of these important things that are a core part of being a human being. And, and that means every state has its own policy and it gets to change it uh, year to year and it often does change. And as of now, only 39 states and the District of Columbia mandate some kind of sex or HIV education. So that means 11 states do not require sex ed of any kind, whether it's quality or not, there is no mandate, which means we can absolutely let uh, young people go through 12 plus years of schooling without ever having a conversation about identity, pleasure, bodies, puberty, consent, relationships, any of that. Which then puts a, a, the burden on caregivers and parents who are also not equipped to have these conversations. Of the 39 states and the District of Columbia, only 29 require abstinence be stressed. So that's kind of like teaching, set, uh, teaching driving by emphasizing don't ever get in, you know, don't get into a car. Don't ever turn on the car, don't use that car. It doesn't really make any sense, right? You're not actually learning anything about using the vehicle or benefiting from learning how to use it. 19 states actually require emphasizing sex within marriage. Also doesn't quite make sense in part because we know marriage rates are declining the purpose of marriage, the goal of marriage has shifted culturally, especially for young folks, the benefits and the needs and the um, desire for marriage no longer, it's just not how it was. And so if we're only emphasizing sex within marriage, we're not actually allowing people to learn about sex with themselves, 
and also all of the other parts of sex education that have nothing to do with actual sexual activity. Because sex ed is way more than, you know, penises, vulvas, orgasms, and all those things. Also about communication skills and relational skills and consent and how to communicate consent, really important stuff. Only nine states in all 50 require that the sex ed information isn't biased by race, ethnicity, or natal sex. That means 41 states offer sex education and relationship education that is disproportionately centering experiences of whiteness, experiences of heterosexuality, heterosexual desire, heterosexual relationships, and cisgender identities. We're leaving out a huge, huge portion of the public by not focusing on uh, these biases. And only three states out of the 50 actually prohibit promoting a religion. So that means it is legal in 47 states to actually uh, promote a specific religious belief system in place of offering accurate information about sex, sexuality, and our bodies. It's kind of scary. And maybe it's more scary for me because this is the industry that I work in now. But this is what young people, this is the next generation of folks. This is what they have access to or don't have access to as they're growing up. A little bit more. Only 11 states and the District of Columbia require inclusive content regarding sexual orientation. So that means all these other states uh, do not require any other mention of sexual orientations aside from heterosexuality. That's a big, big issue, big problem, and we'll talk about why towards the end of this presentation because we have some research that shows how folks are actually identifying at this point. You might be surprised there's a huge chunk of folks who do not identify as heterosexual or do not connect with heterosexual beliefs or activities or uh, identifications. Six states actually require a positive emphasis on heterosexuality. So not just uh, focusing on it, but actually sort of endorsing it as though it is uh, superior or more important or more relevant or healthier than any other kind of sexual orientation. And those same states actually require only negative information about homosexuality. So not only are they disproportionately emphasizing one sexual orientation, they are required to actually be crap on any other kind of sexual orientation. So can you imagine as a young person getting to know yourself, figuring out what you like, what you don't, and feeling kind of stressful or stressed out about what that process is. And then you have authority figures who are in charge of teaching you, not only giving you missing information, but they're actually giving you information that gives you the impression that your own identity and how you feel is not only not normal, but is somehow wrong or may actually lead to negative outcomes in your life. This is happening absolutely to this day, 2021 in the United States. And potentially the most, the most freaky, the most depressing is only 18 states actually mandate accuracy in the content. The rest of them in 32 states, it's legal to lie. And they do because I have absolutely witnessed it. And I have worked with young people and adults who are now trying to reckon with the lies and the misinformation that they've been offered uh, in their classrooms growing up without knowing that this was actually mandated and allowed and permitted by the people in charge. So that means it's legal to provide sex ed that's false or misleading, totally inaccurate, and also manipulative. As we learned about, you know, it, it's manipulative to focus on one sexual orientation and then provide um, any kind of misinformation or any type of biased judgment on any other kind of sex orientation. And so for a lot of folks who are watching this right now, uh, adult stores, especially the hardworking sales staff who are working day to day on the floor, often fill in these sex ed gaps. So again, you can share this at the end if you would like to, but uh, I'd love to hear if anybody has been treated like a sex therapist or a sex coach by shoppers while they've been working. I work with a lot of adult, adult store staff at Etsy, whether they're getting trained or they're getting some, just some professional development coaching on the side. And I have heard some really incredible stories of how they have inadvertently filled in this role that people uh, haven't been able to get anywhere else. And the tricky part, of course, is a lot of staff, they're not equipped to offer this kind of information. It's way above their pay grade. And there isn't a whole lot of support for staff members in order to get the information they might need to provide this level of customer service. So it gets real tricky. And this is one of the reasons why adult retail plays a really significant role in most folks' lives, especially folks who are over the age of 18. But we do know that there are folks under the age of 18 who are also purchasing product online. So we really have a big impact. Adult retailers, in my opinion, were absolutely uh, influencers. And so we have a responsibility there. 
So sex ed and adult retail is not a new trend. I have heard some folks um, talk a little bit negatively about why, you know, how sexual wellness or sex education seems to be taking over in the conversation. And I totally get that because when we are just focusing on wellness and health, we are no longer talking about pleasure, which is one of the key reasons why a lot of folks will engage in any type of sexual expression. They want to feel good because it can feel really good. Health and wellness can come after that. We don't want to just focus on health and wellness. But what's wonderful about sex education is it incorporates the health and the wellness side with the pleasure side, the fun side. How do we have a positive experience? Maybe I don't care about whether my mental well-being is going to be better after I have an orgasm. Maybe I just want to find out how to have one. Maybe that's my issue, right? And so we really want to be able to zoom out a little bit here and think about how uh, sexuality education can really benefit on the retail side beyond just the health and wellness conversation. Sexual health information in adult stores, specifically how um, promoting and offering educational information and health information could actually happen on a sales floor has actually been studied since at least 2004. And that's just the studies that have been published. So it's not a new idea for having uh, adult stores be a harbiter of information that folks can't really access elsewhere. And some of the first feminist sex toy shops who were centering information and affirming support on the sales floor were founded in the 70s. That's a long time ago. It's not a new thing. East Garden, founded by Del Williams, and Good Vibrations, founded by Joni Blank. Good Vibrations, of course, Going Strong, a brand most folks know internationally at this point, have this baked into their foundation. And it's one of the reasons why Good Vibrations has stood out so effectively for so long. Why well, said sex ed sells number two, it is all about the stop shopping experience. So consumers purchase using emotion over logic. There is a lot of research uh, done around like what leads to buying decisions. And we often found that the emotion that is brought up either by the brand or by what the salesperson has shared, that helps push toward that purchase decision and that action and the logic usually comes afterward to justify that purchase. So we're working with consumers, whether it's conscious or not, who are being driven by the feelings they're having in that shopping environment. And that's really important to keep in mind. There's a lot of uh, customer service research that's really interesting to kind of see how uh, that can be brought into this conversation too. And something that came up for me was a, a study, maybe not a study so much as a survey, but American Express had done with uh, its consumers and they asked folks how they would describe a shopping experience that would help them not only just have a memorable experience, but lead them to return to that same retail outlet because of that experience. And competent and knowledgeable was the top rated description of that shopping experience that would lead them to come back. Competent and knowledgeable. So that doesn't necessarily mean that a person on the sales floor has to know all the answers to every single question, right? Competency and knowledge also means you know just how to deal, including you know how to say, I don't know, but I can look that up for you. So you're still there assisting the customer, even if you don't know all the answers to all the questions. And if memory serves, the number one reason that would lead people to actually leave a shopping environment and never return was when they felt rushed or that the experience was rude. So that's a little tidbit to add in here. We also know that the bigger the community that a retail outlet can be in and to, to participate in, the bigger the consumer base. We know that affirming expansive uh, spaces, especially shopping spaces, are transformative. They can be transformative no matter who the person is. Especially when somebody is walking into an adult store, there are a lot of emotions that are coming up for folks. Sometimes it's curiosity and excitement. Sometimes it's shame. Sometimes it's fear. Sometimes it's insecurity and sometimes it can be a casserole of all of those feelings. And so when somebody comes in and has an experience that not only leaves them feeling comfortable and seen and maybe even safe, it can really transform their whole expectation around shopping for an adult product. And they're going to tie that emotional experience to the staff member and or the store that they were in. And they're gonna return, that's where we build loyalty. We know that positive shopping experience, absolutely, uh, they can build relationships with whoever is on the sales floor, as well as a consumer relationship with the brand itself. 
not just the product brand if they bought something, but the brand of the store and the whole feeling and experience they had inside of the walls or on the website. Positive shopping experiences also can lead to positive reviews. Now that a lot of folks are spending most of their time shopping on the internet, having positive reviews online has become more useful, more valuable, and for some people more important than ever. And so uh, really emphasizing how uh, our staff interacts with shoppers, it's really important because this is what then will lead to someone sharing their experience online or sharing with a friend, because we know word of mouth is fantastic marketing. I'll say if for Hotter Media, since it was founded in 2009, I've never advertised. Any client, any company that has ever come my way has been 100% through word of mouth from folks having a positive experience and wanting to share that experience with other people. Same thing with Etsy, with the sex educator certification. We have our certifications filled out before we're even able to promote. And this is the result of, of folks having a positive affirming experience with everyone on staff and having the kind of experience that they would expect to have and hope to have, but they may not have had in other places, especially with other um, competing companies. So we really wanna uh, emphasize the importance of a shopping experience, not for in that moment, but also the impact that it can have days, weeks, even months down the line when it comes to people making recommendations to their friends or to their fellow community members. Number three, why sex ed sells. So it's a little bit of customer service 101, but I want to focus on it specifically when it comes to an experience somebody has when they are shopping for or looking for a sex or pleasure related product. So one thing we uh, many of us know, shoppers will almost always remember how you made them feel, even if you didn't solve their problem, even if you didn't have the product in stock that they were looking for, the way a staff member helps make them feel is the most impactful takeaway that that shopper will have. So that can come in a lot of forms. A staff member, uh, whether it's through um, email or through chat online or in person in a store, answering a customer's questions is really key. A lot of folks who come into adult stores don't just have a question around what is the coolest vibrator or do you have anything from We Vibe in stock? They're also asking questions that have nothing to do with making a purchase. Some of these questions, I mean, they can run along the gamut of, is this normal to like this? Is there something that exists that could actually cater to the thing that I think is kind of hot? Is it okay that I think this is hot? Some folks are coming in, whether they know it or not, looking for a little bit of affirming permission for who they are, how they look, what they like, and what they want. And so sometimes they'll ask a question and we might not know the answer to it. Maybe it's a question about sexual health or pleasure. And we're just like, I don't know. I, I make 10 bucks an hour. I do not have that information. That's super valid. But there's a way to answer that question, even if we don't have the solution, that still helps that person see, feel seen and heard and gives them a really positive experience to take away with them if they leave that store empty handed. It also comes with uh, offering product recommendations that aren't just based on the sales features that we learn in a training or that we know from a package or from any type of brochures that we might have behind the desk. Those are valid 100%. But what shopping and consumer research shows is folks don't immediately respond to just sales features and sales benefits. They, they respond to an emotional reaction to something that they have either experienced from an advertisement that wasn't just about here are the 10 reasons this is amazing, but maybe depict something a little bit more emotional that they can connect to. It also can come from a salesperson who was able to talk about a product, not just about here are the 10 functions and here are the three colors, but here's the experience that this product is meant to offer. What is the experience you are looking for? And now I'm going to find a product that can help give that experience to the person instead of just looking for what kind of vibrator, what shape, how big, how small, rechargeable, what's the price point. That matters, but those aren't the things that are going to drive that immediate decision to make that purchase. Also, having a, um, the skills to offer an affirming experience to uh, active listening skills when you are just sitting there listening to a shopper. Maybe they have a little bit of story to tell. 
This happens frequently with the folks who uh, share their experiences working in stores where part of their job is like listening. So sometimes there is no question to even answer, but they're there to offer uh, an active ear to the person who is not just looking for a product, but also needs to feel heard potentially for the first time. Some people have shared with me that there are shoppers who will share personal information or personal experiences for the very first time in front of a row of dildos. And that was the environment that they felt safe and comfortable to have that conversation in. And in some ways, you know, what an honor to have that opportunity to offer somebody, you know, that is not a normal experience on the job. That is something that feels, it seems to be pretty unique working in the adult industry. Not always welcome. We do need a lot of boundaries, but when it comes to a shopper who's genuinely coming in looking for information and, and is feeling really insecure or potentially like the only one who has ever asked this question or has ever had this experience, it can be really powerful to watch a salesperson listen and not grimace or not close their eyes or not, you know, make some kind of a judgy reaction. And so that is a really powerful experience that shopper can have regardless of whether they buy something. And all of this helps shift that emotional uh, experience that they're having in that environment from what they might have come in with, shame or fear, or curiosity or something else, into something closer to maybe a connection, maybe a sense of security around, okay, I now I do know I'm not the only person. I like hearing that I'm not the only person. And I know I'm not because there's a whole rack of products dedicated to the thing I thought I was the only one liked. It also can help build a sense of connection and not just a connection to maybe the salesperson that they were talking to or the representative they might've been using a chatbot with online, but there's a sense of connection that they can actually build with themselves during the shopping experience. And that's really powerful because they're gonna associate your stores smell, sights, vibe, whatever is, you know, whatever environment they might be in with that positive emotional shift. And those are really key to building and maintaining loyal relationships. And these are the kinds of relationships that not just uh, potentially spark, you know, a, a decent sized purchase in that moment, but helps inspire return visits and multiple return visits. And there's additional, uh, research around consumer and shopping habits, where when folks have a positive experience initially in a shopping environment or with a brand, even if they don't buy something in that moment, they are more likely to spend more when they return in the future. So we might not see an immediate change to the bottom line that day, but that doesn't mean that a positive shift isn't happening. It may be more of a slow burn or a longer game, right? Of course, this isn't a game, but it's really around knowing even in this moment, if this person didn't drop a hundred bucks with me after having this conversation with them, there's a really good chance that they're going to come back when they are ready to buy something and they're going to bring their cash with them. We also know that sex education helps adult retail staff. It's not just about benefiting the public and benefiting the shoppers that we work with. And of course, I do know this firsthand because of the staff that I work with and how they have shared um, how their experience working with consumers directly has shifted as a result of accessing not just some sex ed skills for themselves, but also some communication skills and some skills around how to facilitate information or how to have a difficult conversation or how to answer a question you don't know the answer to. All of that comes with sex education. You know that knowledge is super powerful. Not only is knowledge powerful to, you know, for empowerment and feeling connected and feeling if you have a sense of ownership over yourself and your place in the world, but also knowledge is really powerful when you are working in a store, you have like some ground to stand on. So if somebody does come to you asking for questions, you have something more to offer than just some of the product sales features or some of the benefits that were shared to you by, you know, a, a, a trainer recently. And that gives you some confidence when you're having these conversations that can absolutely be seen and felt. And sales staff deserve to have that kind of support too. It's a lot of work to do this and it's a lot of work to work in an adult store. There's a lot more that comes to it that you don't necessarily experience working in a clothing store, for example. We also know that language is really powerful and it's also constantly changing. Just like the information that we learn and know about sexuality and about bodies, 
and about pleasure, it's changing constantly. And now that we've got things like TikTok and Reddit and Twitter, things like language are shifting even faster than they ever have. And that is often where some of these language shifts are happening in real time in these social media spaces and in these social forums. And so being able to keep up with uh, most recent language, what language is shifting, what language is no longer being used, is not only powerful uh, for um, a shopping experience where a consumer comes in and wants to hear affirming language that they feel comfortable with, but also for the sales staff, they know what language to use and language to avoid. One of the most common reasons that's shared with me uh, that folks do not want to engage with shoppers beyond selling a product is they don't wanna say the wrong thing. They don't wanna hurt someone's feelings. They don't wanna offend anybody. And that's super valid, of course not. But one of the things that can help staff get that confidence to have those conversations is to equip them with information around language choice and how to respond to a concern in a way that is affirming and isn't inadvertently, you know, hurtful or harmful. So sex ed helped us keep up, basically. And there's a lot of research around first impressions. And I, what was interesting is uh, there's all kinds of, you know, there's 30 seconds, I've seen 60 seconds, I've seen four seconds. And uh, there was one study in 2006 around facial expressions that I thought was interesting. They actually found that somebody uh, looking at a person's face, it only took about a tenth of a second for that person to make a judgment around whether that person was going to be helpful or kind or knew what they were doing or knew what they were talking about. I can't even imagine how fast that is. That's so that's faster than I think I can even really you know wrap my head around. And so we don't have a lot of time to make a good positive first impression when we are working with a salesperson, especially if they can visibly see our faces. This is a lot of impression and a lot of judgment that comes from what people are witnessing happening on our face. And so we really want to emphasize how important and useful sex education can be for the staff that we are working with in the store itself, not just to help a, a customer have a positive experience when they're trying to buy something. And this is uh, the actual study. The Harvard Business Review has a lot of really interesting consumer habit research and survey around um, retail trends. And the thing that I've always sort of kept in my mind, I read about this probably three years ago at this point, customers who had their issues handled in less than five minutes were more likely to spend more money on future purchases. And that felt like a really big deal to me because when I hear the word handled, I don't see that as the same as like solved or perfected. I see handled as addressed, right? An issue or a concern or a question was responded to and respected and seen and taken care of in a timely manner. And there's absolute uh, profit that can come from that experience. So you really wanna keep that in mind too, because again, this is not just about making money in that immediate moment, using sex ed and sex ed skills, but helping set the foundation for future profit and for future increases as a result of the time and energy and effort that we're putting in to connecting with our community and our consumer base. And the last key tip for uh, why sex ed sells, the future is expansive, whether you like it or not. So adult retail has historically centered heterosexual shoppers and cisgender shoppers. It has maintained a, a man-woman gender binary, and it has historically gendered products and continues to be a, a form of marketing bias where we see the customer through the product instead of seeing the product through the customer. So what I mean by that is we are thinking about a product and how it's supposed to be used by looking at the product first and then creating a potential customer based on the impression we have looking at the sex toy. What that does is it creates a tiny little tunnel of potential consumers. And that's what we start to focus on when we're making sales pitches or we're having conversations or we're making a product recommendation. And I really want to reverse that, where instead we think about all of the different kinds of folks who could enjoy the product we're thinking of, regardless of what body parts they have or regardless of the color of the item or what's on the packaging. Because what we know is sex toys and pleasure products sell an experience, a physical experience often, and also an emotional experience. 
So when we are limiting ourselves through that sort of tunnel vision, we are uh, limiting our sales possibilities and we're not being as connected to our community and our potential consumer base as we could. And so we also want to make sure that we are keeping up with just what the public demographic looks like, especially when it comes to the next and the future generations of adult retail shoppers. So what was interesting is around six years ago, some of the biggest retailers, including Target and Amazon, had already removed gendered markers from their online and uh, in-person sales environments. And I'm sure that there are some targets who have absolutely not done this in person. I haven't been able to go to every single target in the United States, but Target itself made a public announcement in 2015 that it was removing its boys and girls signs from its bedding departments and from its toy departments and shifting out of gendered markers. And in 2015, Amazon announced that it was also removing boys and girls toy categories. So it's not new that retail environments are shifting into a more expansive approach to selling product. And among the you know, multiple studies that I've read around uh, gender, how gender impacts consumer habits and spending habits, this one particular study from Retail Perceptions found that 25% of the men who were surveyed reported that they, they had actually purchased a product that was geared toward women for themselves. And 46% of the women surveyed had purchased a product geared toward men for themselves. So these, the like gendering a product itself or making a product recommendation based on something like gender isn't actually effective anymore. Folks, even within those limitations are still making buying decisions outside of that binary marketing technique. So imagine what would happen if we took those limitations and walls off and focused on usage and experience instead of identity and gender markers. Especially knowing this was from six years ago, I can only imagine how these percentages have increased over the last six years. And so what would happen if there weren't those markers or those limitations in general? I have to imagine that those percentages would increase to the point where there wouldn't be any need to gear a product toward one or another category of person because we are so focused on selling an experience. Now, in 50, uh, these are some studies from around 2007, 2008. So I am going to guess that the uh, numbers here are way higher than reported. More than 15 million people in the United States identify as something other than heterosexuality, or excuse me, heterosexual. That's a, a huge load of people. And more than 2 million people in the United States reported that they identified as transgender or gender non-conforming. So outside of a cisgender man or woman identity, and that's definitely way more than 2 million. 2 million is a huge number of folks. And in 2017, again, this is maybe four, you know, four-ish years ago, uh, a survey done by an organization, nonprofit called Ditch the Label had found that 57% of folks aged between 13 and 26 who participated in their survey said that they don't actually fit the traditional definition of heterosexuality. So 57%, that's a majority. That's a large number. And age 13 to 26, not only do we have on the higher side of that age range, we've got current existing shoppers. And then from 13 to 18, we've got the next generation of shoppers. So if we are still focusing on heterosexual coupling, men and women love to use this, or assuming that a vibrating cock ring is something for clitorises as well as penises, we are still keeping ourselves narrowly focused on just one identity. And we really wanna keep in mind like these, this is the future here and we wanna stay as relevant as we can, especially in a competitive market. That's the current and the next generation of sex toy shoppers. So we do know that not only sex ed can help us, but it also can help them. And we can stay as relevant as ever, especially when we are thinking about all of the competition out there, all of these sort of mainstream brands who are now deciding to go into the sexual wellness space and they have way more access to venture capital and funding. One of the things that can help adult retailers really stay relevant and stay special is that customer relationship that often is built as a result of the conversations had in a customer service environment, whether it's digitally or in person. So here are some resources. There are so many resources out there. 
Uh, but I wanted to just cram a couple onto this slide. So of course I'd have to talk about Etsy. I'd be terrible at marketing myself if I didn't. Among the services and resources that we have that are applicable to adult industry professionals are the 35 hour sex educator certification. So it is a more formal training experience where you are dedicating 35 hours, about five days total, to learning from me and 11 other educators to gain a foundational understanding of not just sex, sexual health, and sex education topics, but also communication tools and ways to interact with the public in ways that can be really effective and affirming and helpful. And it gives you the skills to have conversations confidently. We also offer a series of master classes at least once a year, we are just about to finish up our clip literate masterclass series. It's all about vulvas and the bodies that house them. We also offer private virtual trainings and something called a sexual attitude reassessment, which is a little bit different from a training where you're really showing up to see how your brain and your body re responds and reacts to a variety of bits of information or exposure to communities or experiences that outside of the sexual attitude reassessment you may not have had access to. And it just gives you information around, oh, this is something that makes me uncomfortable and I had no idea. I'm glad I know about this now so that I didn't get like triggered as hell when I was working, you know, when I'm working and trying to make a strong impression. It's also something that clinicians attend and a lot of doctors will attend too. So we can just sort of see like where are our biases and our judgments and our, you know, our limitations, where are they without really doing the work ahead of time, we won't actually know where those limitations are until like we're experiencing them in real time. And that can be super uncomfortable and also not great for business. Also an organization called Anti Up run by Dr. Bianca Loriano, highly recommended. A lot of her online courses are not just are focused on identity and experiences in sexuality, but also have a very focused and intentional justice bent. So we're looking at topics, not just around um, you know, pleasure and bodies, but also who has access to pleasure and what bodies are policed and what bodies are not, and how do we build knowledge around that so that we can better serve our public. Bianca also offers a variety of sexual attitude reassessments that are targeted to very specific um, topics, including uh, something called a fat SAR or a fat sexual attitude reassessment. Uh, that she co-hosted and it's just incredibly powerful learning not just around your own judgments around fatness and fat bodies and whether fat bodies are you know permitted to access pleasure or which products are even built for a fat body to use and enjoy but it's also really affirming an important um, personal development experience and yes I have taken that SAR before so I can say that from personal experience as well I do uh, I co-teach my SAR with Bianca and that's how amazing Bianca is. I want her in, involved in everything I possibly can. And Bianca also offers a certification around justice-oriented sex education. Highly recommended. And at the bottom of the screen, there are three websites that I highly recommend to folks who just need a quick answer to something, especially if you need uh, something you know, really quickly, you're working at the counter somewhere, or you need to answer an email to somebody. Scarletteen.com is a great place to get quick information. It is very heavily text-based, so it does involve a lot of reading, but it's incredibly comprehensive and it's a nonprofit. It's been around for, I believe, about 25 years. And there's a lot of content there. And sexpositivefamilies.com is also highly recommended. They have a great resource list, especially when it comes to working with folks who are a little bit younger. And especially for folks if, you know, outside of our job, we might have kids, we might be aunts and uncles to someone, you might know a young person who needs some support. So Sex Positive Families is a great place to go so that we can help prepare ourselves to have those conversations. And PlannedParenthood.org slash learn, another really great place to just search for something really quick to make sure that you have the answer to something or the right answer to something or to double check something that uh, you want to make sure that you understand. Highly recommend that portal. And then of course, ECN's Sex Ed Guides. As uh, Pete and Linda had mentioned at the beginning, these are really convenient digital guides that can be flipped through on a phone, on a computer screen, and also can be printed out and, you know, stapled together so you have quick access, especially behind a register. So highly recommend these resources. And I'm happy to offer this resource slide and all these slides to anybody who wants access to them after this. And I believe uh, he has just put all of the guides, the link to the guides up in the chat right now. And that's it. Thank you so much for having me here. And of course, thanks to the ECN team. Um, 
for inviting me and to opening the space to having this kind of conversation and this kind of workshop. And I would like to open it up to questions. So I am going to stop my screen share so I can actually see what's happening. I have a number of questions here for you, Anne. So I, oh, can I bet this for I you. Good one. Um, I'm going to just go in the order that they came in for you. Um, sure. So at the beginning, Melissa Skelton was asking, is the 35 hour sex education certification able to be obtained by adult store workers like us or just people that work with you? Oh, anybody. Yeah, we have, we've had lots of people. We've had folks from Lion's Den. We've had folks from some manufacturers come in. Absolutely any professional. There's no like, prerequisite around um, previous education. You can absolutely come in as a total noob. It is entry level to the point where everyone is welcome, but there are folks, including sex workers who come in and are surprised by what they're able to learn from all of the educators that we have. So everybody is welcome and invited to, uh, to take that training. Awesome. Um, I actually know that some of the vendors and people in the industry have taken her course and they talk about how much it's helped them do trainings better and it's changed the way that they speak when they're doing their trainings. And then it kind of sparks the, the people that they're training to, to start using those same words and start asking the questions of why are you using those words, uh, you know, instead of this, or what does that mean? And then they're able to explain it and pass that education along. So it, it's a great tool to be educated. And we're super appreciative of you taking the time to do this with us. Um, Gabby is saying, she said, store manager for one location and buyer training coordinator for our three Adam and Eve locations. She was born and raised in Texas and abstinence only education over here. Mm -hmm. Yep, that makes sense. And of course, for folks who uh, are you know, up on the news, the recent six week abortion ban just was put in place this morning in Texas. So there is a lot going on uh, in the sex ed community around uh, supporting folks in Texas right now. Yeah, there's a lot going on in Texas. <laughs> Grace lives out there and she informs me every day how uh, she's got that fight going on. Um, this is back when you were talking about um, every day the retailers deal with like sexual harassment or people saying inappropriate things. Nicole, I'm not even going to mispronounce her last name, but Nicole says, yes, every day, but I am also a certified medical assistant. Tina Jones says she jokingly tells her friend she is a sex therapist and educator all the time. She's not entirely wrong. It takes her so much research. Um, this is a common thing. I had a few of my reps actually text me and some of the customers ask for this. They're asking if your PowerPoint presentation is going to be made available so that they can get some of that information and get some of the facts that you have within it. Yeah, sure. I'll, um, I'll put it in a PDF form and I can email it to you. Perfect. Uh, so if anybody would like to get, I've seen some emails come through already, but if you're interested in obtaining Anne's awesome PowerPoint, just shoot marketing at ECN an email, and then I will get that out to you as soon as I have it. 